Welcome to Lexicology, the study of words. We're weeks into the course, and it's about time we took a stab at defining word. There are different ways to define the word word. Jackson and Z.M. Vela present three approaches, none of which by themselves are satisfying. The first type of definition relies on the writing system. We've grown so accustomed to reading that we generally think of a word as a unit made up of letters with a space before and after it. This definition doesn't work for us because many so-called words in English are actually made up of several words. Think of the example phonograph record, which is a single unit of meaning, but is made up of what our intuition tells us are two separate words. A second type of definition relies on a psychological approach. A word in this light is a unit of thought. As you get more experience with morphemes and meaning, you'll see that this approach won't scan with your intuitive sense of what a word is, since many words can be decomposed into smaller units or morphemes. Finally, the third type of definition relies on a formal analysis. This definition provided by Bloomfield in the early 20th century doesn't handle relational words or grammatical morphemes very well. It should be apparent by now that defining a word isn't going to be easy. Thankfully, in this course, we'll rely on your intuitive sense of what a word is, but this doesn't let you off the hook completely. We need to, at the very least, come up with a simple definition to hang our hats on. After all, you're budding lexicologists. Early in the course, I presented nine facets of word knowledge. To review quickly, when we think about what we know of words, we realize that our knowledge can be broken down into many categories. We know a lot more than we thought we knew about words. The phonology is the sound of the word. The word's orthography is a word's written form. The reference is the thing associated with a particular word, and the semantics is the meaning of the word in different contexts. In addition, we can think about a word's usage, that is, its register or how it's used appropriately in different situations. For example, a formal job interview versus chatting with my friends. Collocation, words that often go together, for example, flex is almost always near the word muscle, and wink near eye. Linguists interested in speeding up search engines do quantitative studies of spoken or written texts to see what words tend to be near each other. This leads us to word association, which is best thought of as the network of mental word links in our minds. Think of this as the type of link that a psychologist might look for in her patients. Finally, we know how words fit the syntax or the grammar of our language, and we understand the morphology or the smaller units of meaning that comprise a word. It's morphology that you're exploiting as you learn the meaning of a few base forms in each, uh, in each unit of this course. Now I think you can appreciate why it's not a simple matter to define what we mean by the word, word. To simplify matters, we can say that a word has a meaning, a group of sounds, and a grammatical function. A linguist might say that a word is a semantic, phonological, and grammatical unit. Linguists recognize that words are constantly changing in both form and meaning. In lexicology, we study the contrasts and similarities between words and how these change over time. For the purposes of this course, we will use the definition given in our text. The problem with this definition is that it seems a little difficult to understand. I'll leave it for you to put this definition into your own words. At this point in the course, you can do it. The first day of class, you would not have been able to understand or explain this definition. See if you can translate this definition into something that one of your friends who is not a linguist would understand. Let's continue our exploration of meaning and sound of words by looking at two relationships we often encounter in English, polysemy and homonymy. 
Polysemy is the situation in which a word has two or more related meanings. Polysemy is quite common across languages. It makes sense. We can be more economical with our memories by using the same words in many different ways. The key here is that the meanings of polysemous words are related. The meanings are related. Sometimes the relationship may seem a little tenuous, but chances are, if you can make a case for the relationship between the meanings, the words are probably related in some way. For example, the word mark has many definitions, and if we think about them, we realize that in general, a mark is some sort of graphic sign. So we might think of the mark of Zorro, or a scribble we make with a marker, or grades in school, or even the reduced prices we see in a sale when all the prices have been marked down. Remember, when the word has several meanings that are related in some fundamental way, this is polysemy. Homonymy, on the other hand, is the situation in which words that sound the same have completely unrelated meanings. The classic example is the word bank. This could be the bank of a river, or a bank where we deposit our lottery winnings. The meanings are not easily seen as related, but the structures of the words certainly are. They are homonyms. There are different types of homonymy. Here we have a board, but we can also drill into the ground and talk about how we board into the earth. These two identically sounding words have completely different meanings, and they also have different spellings. They are called homophones. We might also have a situation where the two words are spelled the same and sound the same, but have completely different meanings. These words are called homographs. These are two subcategories of homonyms. You probably recognized individual morphemes within the terms homograph and homophone. Even if you didn't know what these terms meant, you could probably make a pretty good guess based on the smaller units of meaning. Consider the word phonograph record. You should be familiar with all of the morphemes within this word. We see the phoneme graph in words such as autograph, biography, and graphite. The phone morpheme we find in phoneme, megaphone, telephone. In the word record, we recognize the re prefix meaning again, and the chord in the words accord, discord, and cordial. Graph seems to have something to do with writing, phone with sound, Re, meaning again, and chord, meaning something like agreement. Studying the base forms and learning about the history of words has already given you some excellent insights into how words are put together. You're probably finding base forms in many of the words you encounter. This includes words that you never knew could be broken down into simpler meaning units. You'll be surprised by all the crazy morphemes out there and how they are the foundation for many of the words that you already know. I will leave this last slide as an exercise for you to determine the relationships in these homonyms. Enjoy.